Welcome, beloved siblings, sciencing the day today with the man who, when I tell the story, is the world's greatest living physicist. Nick Gross, PhD, lecturer in physics at Boston University, as I say, the world's greatest living physicist. <laughs> First of all, you're not in Boston. No, I'm hey. in Boulder, Colorado. I'm at a hotel right near the High Altitude Observatory uh, offices and labs. So the High Altitude Observatory is a part of um, the University Corporation for Atmosphere Research. Well, I'm here because we're running some workshops for graduate students on uh, space physics. And the High Altitude Observatory is a, a place to um, where... Uh, that historically they observed the sun. They physically had an observatory here at one point in time. Now they do it remotely with a telescope in Hawaii and then uh, satellite-based telescopes. You're there in Boulder talking about space physics to... Graduate students. So graduate students who are getting started in the field. And uh, some of them are brand new. And so we're talking about things like the solar corona and solar flares. And they're like... Solar what? There's a guy named Guillermo Gonzalez, who is a astrobiologist, who did this okay. beautiful article in Scientific American called Beautiful Eclipses, and talked about how that, um, long story short, obviously eclipses are really tough, to, hard to come by. As far as we know, the only place in the, in the universe where you can see them is Earth. And he said... Very, very, very strange that, that uh, sort of circumstances that allow us to see the total eclipses that we see, yes. Right, yeah. The, the, the sun is 400 times further away than the moon, but the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, so it happens to fit. But here's the question. Is, he says, and I, it, it sounds like you're uh, uh, confirming, that there are things about physics that you can only learn during total eclipses. You can, you can only see what they call the flash corona. Is that right? Yes and no, I would say. I think today, now, we've got instruments that allow us to do... Uh, some of those things, is, but but they can only be done either in uh, at uh, on top of a mountain, uh, pretty high up, or in space. Um, and so, but yes, the uh, the eclipses uh, themselves allow us to view just be, because the it, it's it's a total eclipse and not annular. So the moon is is not not an annular eclipse. If it's just a little bit too close, you you see some of the disk of the sun, and it's just so bright that it blinds everything else. But if it's if it's a total a total eclipse and it just covers the, the entire disk of the sun, then you see uh, the outer the the the, clo the atmosphere the quote unquote atmosphere of the sun that's closest. I wouldn't want to breathe that atmosphere. <laughs> The atmosphere of the sun that's just closest to the uh, the uh, the surface, and so, um, um, and so if you take imagery of that and the, and the last eclipse, the one that, that happened in uh, 2017 in the summer, they they have a lot of imagery of that and um, and gain some scientific uh, knowledge. But recently, and I'll, I'll I'll send you a couple of links. Um, we have spacecraft in the last decade or so that are constantly monitoring the sun for solar activity. And um, one of the things that they do is they take, the, they take an image that could be between two and ten times the width of you know, if you, the, the solar radius. So you, you zoom in on the sun, but the, the image covers a, a right. factor of many solar radii. And you put a disk right in the middle of that that covers up the sun. Right, and now I can see the atmosphere around the sun uh, because well, you, of that. You, you people are manufacturing counterfeit eclipses. <laughs> Artificial eclipses. Yes. Ah, ah, if you can't trust an eclipse, what can you trust anymore? Oh my goodness! You see, science ruins everything. Yes, ah. we make artificial eclipses. I know. I. We also see it in false color. Say what? So have you heard about have you heard about using false color? No. 
Oh, okay. So right, is this going to upset my, my conception of the universe again? Do you know how you've seen pictures of, you know, this was taken in the infrared, and it shows the red and the blue and the green? Well, of course, that we can't see in the infrared. So you've got, you've got to convert whatever the, 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 the instrument is sensitive in the infrared. Uh, but then you've got to convert those signals into something that we can see. So we, we use some conversion factor to um, uh, put them in red oh, and group, okay. blue and green. Them, so then we can see, okay, this, this yellow region is hot, but this blue region is cold, right? Um, but you can do the same thing in whatever wavelengths you want. So, for example, we can, we can do that in ultraviolet, in extreme ultraviolet, and x-rays. So we can take pictures of the sun in all these different wavelengths, and that's our other way of seeing yeah. what's happening at the at the very very close into the sun because the those wavelengths aren't drowned out by the background just brightness of the sun because most of the brightness of the sun is in the uh, in the visible. So it sounds like what you're saying is that these false colors are sort of representations to let out ways of us for us to visualize parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we could not otherwise perceive. Absolutely yes. Okay. 